Well, good evening. I'm Deacon Don Singer. I'm assigned here at St. Teresa's. Welcome to Catholic 101. Tonight we're going to talk a little bit about the Ten Commandments. The reason that it is important that you're here tonight is because in the vows of baptism, when we baptized our children, we promised to God and to Jesus and to the Holy Spirit, we promised that we would be the first teachers of our children. So it's our obligation as Catholics to teach our children all about Christianity, all about Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, God, the Father, Mary, all of those things, and the Ten Commandments. So that's what we're going to do here tonight, a little brief, a brief class on the Ten Commandments to get you used to looking at them and, and, and understanding them. Most of us know about them. Most of us can recite most of them. And so we're not here tonight so that you can just learn how to recite all of them. That's something you'll do on your own time. But we are going to kind of go over them a little bit, look at, look at some of the formation of it and where it came from, and then we're going to have a little discussion among ourselves. Before we do that, as we should do everything, let us start in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Lord, thank you for allowing us this opportunity to gather here tonight as a family to learn of your laws and to learn of your commandments so that we can in turn teach our children those laws and those commandments so that they can follow them and to be good Christians and good adults and good citizens. We ask that you bless us and that we also have a, a fruitful evening where we can have a good discussion. We ask that you keep your Holy Spirit with us to guide us and we ask that you give us a safe return home. We ask all of this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. James, do me a favor. Give every adult a pen and a pad while I start talking a little bit. As I said, we're going to talk about the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments are known by several things. They're known as the Ten Commandments. They're known as the Decalogue, deca meaning ten. It's also known as the Law. Some people say the Mosaic Law after Moses because they were handed to Moses. And the Ten Words of Sayings. These are all terms that have been used for the Ten Commandments. Regardless, they all mean the same thing. There are Ten Commandments. They are not all of the things that we should be doing in our lives. They are basic precepts or basic laws, fundamental laws that we must follow in order to lead a good life. Well, how did this all come about? Moses was in the desert leading the Israelites. He went up on Mount Sinai and God spoke to him and God gave him the laws. So this is not something Moses thought up. This is not something any man thought up. It is something that God brought to us. And as it says in the Bible, it was written by the finger of God. So Moses was given these two tablets with the Ten Commandments. And all of those commandments were on there, and they were written by the finger of God. Why did God feel that he needed to write something down? Why did God feel that he needed to give us something tangible to look at? Well, at this time, as the Israelites were going through the deserts, they were getting kind of unruly. They were giving Moses a little bit of a hard time. They never had enough food. They never had enough water. They were traveling forever. They started getting out of hand, and they started getting away from the faith. And God looked down and he said to himself, you know, these people need something more than this. They need something concrete so that they can follow it because obviously on their own, they're not following it. Most of us, if you have a child and you tell that child to do three things, two, maybe one of those things will get done. As a matter of fact, that's a psychological test where someone will give a child a series of things that they're supposed to do and then they'll count to see how far they get along. Well, all of this was part of the covenant. You know, the people knew what they were supposed to do. They knew what was right and what was wrong. But they started to stray from it, just like little children. As a matter of fact, God called them children so many times. Moses called them children because they acted like little children, wandering through the desert, going on their own, making up their own rules as they went, and getting far away from the faith. So God said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to put it in concrete terms so that you can understand it. Now... You can find the Ten Commandments in, in a couple of different places in the Bible. If you go to Exodus and look at Exodus 20, you'll see the Ten Commandments. If you go to Deuteronomy 5, 
you will see the Ten Commandments. You might want to write that down because it would be a good idea for you to pick up your Bibles and look at Scripture and start looking at these Ten Commandments. Look at them in both, both verses to kind of see the differences and see how they're written down. I'm going, to, I'm going to read to you a couple of them here in a few minutes and you can see the difference. This is from the Catholic Encyclopedia. The Ten Commandments are precepts, laws, bearing on the fundamental obligations of religion and morality and embodying the revealed expression of the Creator's will in relation to man's whole duty to God and to his fellow creatures. So when you look in the Old Testament, you look at the five books of Moses, which is known as the Pentateuch, you will see, as I said, Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5. You'll be able to look at those. Our catechism also lists them. I'm going to give you an example. If you look at Exodus, and we're talking about the very first commandment, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. If you look at Deuteronomy, it says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. The traditional catechetical formula, which is our catechism, I am the Lord your God. You shall not have strange gods before me. You know, when we read Scripture, sometimes it's a little difficult to understand exactly what is being said. These are no different. If you look at them, you're saying, what are they trying to say? No other gods before me. That means God is God. He is the only God. The Jews at that time formed what was called monotheism. Mono meaning one, theism meaning belief in God. Prior to that, there were all kinds of gods. You know, the Romans, later on, much later on, the, the Romans who were pagans had all kinds of gods, Jupiter, and, you know, they would pray to all these statues, and these were their gods. That's polytheism, where you have many gods. So God is laying down the law here saying, there is only one. It is me. I am. That's the first commandment. So now I'm going to go through the rest of them, but I'm going to do the catechetical form, because we don't need to get all involved in all of these long forms. Number two, you shall not take the, the name of your Lord God in vain. Number three, remember to keep holy the Lord's day. And we're going to talk about all of these in a minute. Number four, honor your father and your mother. Number five, you shall not kill. Number six, you shall not commit adultery. Number seven, you shall not steal. Number eight, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Number nine, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. And number 10, you shall not covet your neighbor's goods. So let's talk about the first one. We're going to go through one through 10. I am the Lord your God. You shall not have strange gods before me. We've talked about that. There is only one God. It is he. Number two, you shall not take the, the name of the Lord your God in vain. Can anybody tell me what that means? Anybody? Anybody ever heard somebody curse at someone using the Lord's name? Okay. There's two forms of that. Yes, sir. Very close. It is also if you use his name to curse someone. Okay. If I were to say, I wish God would curse you, I have just used God's name in vain. If I use the GD word, and we all know what that is, I've used God's name in vain. Now, in today's society, words fly out all the time. We say all kinds of words. This is important. Because God is telling us we worship Him. His name is sacred. The Jews could not say God. If you see someone who is a good Jew and they write the word God, they will write capital G hyphen D. They will not put the vowel in. They will not say God. Yahweh, Lord, those are the names they use. They, they, they don't say God. It's forbidden. That's how important this name is. It is everything to us. So when you're on the street and you hear somebody casually throw those things out, how sad that is. And we all have to discipline, myself included, because I ran the streets a lot when I was a kid. 
and I used all kinds of words. And I hit that confessional booth, and I, and I said I was sorry. And it took me a lot of discipline, particularly when I went through the Army, to get rid of that. You have to work on it. I have a friend who's also a deacon. He's over at St. Charles Borromeo who works in a shop. And as we were going through the seminary, he went into his space in the shop and he took all pictures off and he made sure there were pictures of Jesus, pictures of our Blessed Mother, his children. He never swore. And within a two-year period of time, now that seems like a long time, but to me, within a two-year period of time, the entire plant did the same thing. No swearing, no pictures, no funny calendars of, of girls in bikinis and things. They removed all of that on their own because he led by example. He didn't get up in front of them at lunchtime and say, hey, guys, we shouldn't swear. Let's all not swear. Let's all not, you know, be filthy mouthed. And No, he didn't do that. He just did what he was supposed to do. They followed. That's a good lesson to us as parents because our children are watching us. They watch every move we make. And they learn. And if we teach them right, they learn right. If we teach them wrong, I minister in the prisons. I see, I see guys that have been led wrong. And they didn't have good parental guidance. Remember to keep the holy the Lord's day. Anybody know what that means? It means a couple things. Anybody? I bet you do, huh? No? Okay. Keep holy the Lord's day means two things. Number one, we are to come together as a family, as we do in the church building, okay? We are the church, but we're the body of the church, and we meet in that building on the Lord's day to keep holy that day. But it also means when you leave there to have a relaxing day with your family, not to labor, not to toil, not to argue, not to go doing all kinds of crazy things all over this world. And sometimes that's hard to do because we have so many activities in our life that we feel like we have to fill up every second of them. Keeping the Lord's Day means taking a break, relaxing, be with your family. Once again, on the Lord's Day, if you were a Jew, which starts Friday night at sundown and goes till Saturday at sundown, you don't do anything. A good Jew won't drive a car, won't start a fire, won't do any kind of labor of any kind. They relax. They do nothing. Matter of fact, um, the synagogue that's over in Bel Air, Brith Shalom, was looking for a new rabbi. And the rabbi came down and interviewed, and he was from Pennsylvania, and he liked what he saw, and he wanted to be the rabbi here. And he said, by the way, I need a house, and it needs to be within walking distance of the synagogue because he won't drive on the Lord's day. That sounds a little extreme, maybe, but really... That's taking the law to heart and, and seeing what the Lord's day is. Now, that doesn't mean you can't sit down and enjoy football and have a party. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about if it's at all possible, sit down and relax with your family, enjoy time with the Lord and with worship, and carry that worship home with you and have a wonderful day with your family. Any questions on that? Okay. Number four, honor your father and your mother. That's pretty obvious. You have a father and mother that brought you into this world. You are a gift to them. How do you honor them? You on- Go ahead. Obeying them. Obeying them, correct. Any, anything else? How else? Respect. A lot of people think respect has to be earned, and I agree with that, except the respect of certain positions is understood. If you are a parent... That demands and commands a certain amount of respect. Now, you may not be the best parent, but you're the parent. You have to draw the line somewhere, and that respect is important. It it also means favoring your mother and father, helping them. But let me ask you a question. What if your mother and father are abusive? What if they're extremely abusive? Does this still fit? How can you honor your father and mother if they are just crazy abusive? Anybody? Anybody? Well, think about this. That's that side of the fence. In other words, that's here coming to you. Now, maybe they're not honoring you and treating you right as a child, but you, on the other hand, can be on this side of the fence and look at them and say, regardless of how you are, you're my father and mother, 
I honor you for it. I don't agree with what you're doing to me or at me or at my sister or at anybody. But you are my parents and I respect you and I will honor you. So you can. Sometimes that's not the way our minds want to work. We've got very fast computers here and we want to get angry and we want to fight back maybe or we want to get revenge or we want to lash out at them. What we need to do is take a breath, settle down a little bit and remember that we can be respectful and just back off and say, I'm, I'm, I'm just not going to get into that with you. Okay? Not always easy to do. You shall not kill, number five. Anybody talk about how different ways we can kill? Words. Kill with words. You can kill a person's reputation. You can outright kill that person. You can murder that person. Does everybody kind of understand that? I, I minister in the prisons, and I see a lot of guys in the prisons, and I see, I have 20 guys that I work with, and 17 are violent offenders. Okay, and they're trying to work their way back to society. They're trying to, to make something of themselves. Now, they're not all going to succeed. Now, I'm not worried about you and me in this room. I'm worried about those guys because someday they're going to be out among us. I buried one today. Joe was a killer. Right here. He repented all his life. He spent 33 years behind bars. Now, the truth is, he got out. Now, if you have someone who is behind bars and they're repenting, that's one thing. But what if you have someone who's behind bars and he's becoming a better criminal and hating more and more? And he comes out. He's going to do some major damage. That's where the Catholic Church drew the line. But now we have a different legislative kind of thing. We, have, we, we don't have to worry about that anymore because there is life without parole. So remember that when you see that in the news. Capital punishment still happens here, but sometimes they get life without parole. You shall not commit adultery. Everybody understand what that means? It is not necessarily just the physical act. We do know that, right? Because the Bible says if you lust in your heart, you might as well be committing adultery. Let me ask you a question. If there's a, a, a couple and one of them is on the Internet and they are flirting and chatting with someone in Iowa that they knew in high school, and they're getting kind of racy with it. What is that? Is that adultery? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Internet's a dangerous thing in so many ways, and it's a wonderful thing. It's like anything else. It's got both sides of that sword. And so we need to remember that. If we make acquaintances with other people, if it's platonic, if it's strictly a friendship thing, and that's truly, honestly, what is in your heart, that's one thing. But there have been so many cases where marriages have been broken up because somebody gets on that computer and at 3 o'clock in the morning is having messages with some childhood sweetheart. We need to remember that. We need to protect our children from that. Hopefully you have some type of software on there that will block these things so that your children are not seeing pornography and all kinds of things. You shall not steal. Once again, several definitions. Stealing might be picking up this phone and saying, I'm going to steal this phone and put it in my pocket, steal a car. That's not the only kind of stealing. What if your job requires you work eight hours a day and you leave after six and a half every day? Are you stealing? What are you stealing? What else? Absolutely. What else? Yes. You're receiving pay for something you're not giving work for. If you're paid for eight hours, you should work for eight hours. Your employer is in good faith giving you a check in his heart thinking or her heart thinking that you've done your job, that you've worked the way you're supposed to work. There's all kinds of little things that just don't seem to pop up so easily in our brains as we talk about these commandments. That's why they're basic. They're at one point so very basic that there's only 10 of them, but at another point they're so intricate because you can go deeper and deeper into each one. And that's what I want you to do on your own time. And the reason I want you to do that is so that you can pass that along to your children. These are written down in our catechism. They're easy enough to find. If you go on the Internet and just ask, to, you know, ask for the Ten Commandments, you can print them up. 
You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. We call it lying. Okay, thou shalt not lie. Bearing false witness means I tell you that I saw her do something wrong when she didn't do that. Or getting in a group of people, four or five together, and, and gossiping about someone else about things that they did or did not do. It's not just an out and out lie. This is my little son over here. He asked me just a few minutes ago. If someone asks me to listen to their music and I listen to it and I don't like it, but I don't want to hurt their feelings, if I say I like it, is that a lie? Is it? Yes, it is. Yes. Okay. Has that ever happened to you? Those are what we used to call, and I don't know if you still do, you can see I'm an older guy, little white lies. You're trying not to hurt somebody's feeling. How does this dress look on me? Careful, guys. You know what I'm talking about? Careful. Truth is, is that it's best in our hearts if we try to stay on that straight and narrow path. Jesus Christ tells us that the path from here to him is narrow. And it is narrow, meaning there are a lot of rules, a lot of things we have to do, particularly as Catholics. We seem to be burdened with rules. They're not really a burden. Most of us have had them all our lives, and we we really don't mind them. But if if you think about it, the path is really very wide because Jesus Christ, especially through, uh, through confession, allows us to come back. So if you're, if, if you're walking a straight line, that's wonderful. But if you come over here and you, you mess up a little bit, you hit the confession booth, it brings you right back here. Now, it doesn't bring you right back here if what you do is tell somebody something in the confession, knowing in your heart that you want to do it again. Okay? Want to do it again. You're in there saying, I'm going to try my best not to do it again. Everybody understand that? The act of contrition. I've lost my place. Bear with me. Okay. I want to talk about coveting. These are the terms that coveting means... Does it just mean wanting? Does, to you, if someone says, I, I covet that car, does that just mean they just want that car? Or does it mean something different? Coveting to me means, I want it and I'm going to find a way to take it away from that person. I'm going to make, I'm going to make it mine, whatever I have to do. There's a guy working and he's, he's above me. He's my supervisor. I covet his job. And I'm going to find some way of taking that job away from him because it belongs to me. That should be my job. That's coveting. There's two covets in here. Covet thy neighbor's wife. Covet thy neighbor's goods. Now let's talk about coveting thy neighbor's wife. Kind of goes hand in hand with adultery, doesn't it? Okay? The Jews, if, if, if a man's, if a woman's husband died, his brother would become her husband. Whether he was married or not, he would become her husband. Okay? That was common practice. Now David, David, the king of Israel, this great man, stands on top of his roof and he looks across at another roof and he sees Bathsheba taking a bath and what does he say? I'm the king, I want her. Her husband was Uriah. He coveted her. He took it the step further. Not only did he covet her, he put it into action. Uriah was one of his generals. He's out in the field fighting. And while he's out in the field fighting, David goes and has her come to his house and takes her as his own and impregnates her. Okay, He's taken coveting all the way. Then he realizes she's pregnant and he's got to figure some way out of, of explaining this. So he has Uriah brought back from the field, and he tells Uriah, go home and enjoy your wife, and thank you for everything you're doing. And Uriah says, I'm not going to go sleep with my wife. I'm not going to have relations with her. How can I do that 
with my men suffering in the field. Sounds like Uriah's a pretty good guy. So he goes back. So David, you know, times are wasting. We got nine months to fix this problem. Okay? Calls him back in, gets him dead drunk, sends him home because he figures with a little liquor, now he's going to want to be with his wife. Uriah sleeps on the doorstep. So what does David do? He sends him back out and brings another general in and says, here's what I want you to do. While you're out in the field in the heat of battle, I want you to go to the most dangerous place with Uriah in the front. And as soon as they come out of their walls and start fighting in, in the most dangerous time, I want you to pull back. And when you pull back, he'll be killed. And that's what happened. Uriah was killed. So King David, our great king, the king of Israel, the anointed one, the one who killed Goliath, is an adulterer. Am I right? Okay. He's a murderer. He's a liar. This guy's doing all kinds of bad stuff. So Nathan, his advisor, comes to him, and Nathan knows about all of this. And he says to him, I need some advice. David says, what do you need? He said, if a man is wealthy and he has sheep, and he sees the sheep that belongs to a poor man and takes it, what should we do? He said, that man should be killed. And Nathan says, that man is you. And he brings it to his attention. And at that point, David decides to repent. Because Nathan said to him, your house will never settle. You will always have a sword in your hand. In other words, you're always going to be fighting. You will not have peace. This child will die. And that's exactly what happened. And David repented. If you get a chance, and you might want to write this down, look at Psalm 95. Clergy all over the Catholic world every day has to do Liturgy of the Hours. We read morning prayers. Priests are ob obligated to read five times a day. Deacons, two times a day. So we get up in the morning and we read our morning prayer and we read evening prayer before we go to bed. On Fridays typically, and I like it because I go to the prisons on Friday, we read Psalm 95. Psalm 95 was written by David and it is where he is repenting. It's a beautiful psalm. It's one that I like to read before going to confession because what he says in there is, God, you don't want anything. You don't want me burning stuff on the altar. You don't want me doing all these things. What you want from me is a repented heart, repentive heart. You want a, a contrite, open heart. I understand. And then he goes on in his life and becomes the greatest king, the greatest king of Israel. What does that say to you and I in terms of the Ten Commandments? It says you can break the Ten Commandments, and if you repent, and if you say to yourself, I need to do something to open my heart up, you can do that. It's available to you. Look at all the crimes that David did. And I tell this to my prisoners all the time. I don't care what you've done to be in it. I can't ask them what they've done. They volunteer and tell me what they've done. It's pretty scary. But I don't care because you're in here paying the price. Are you repentant or not? Some of them get out and they sit outside for about 30 days and then boom, they're right back in because they like their old ways. Instead of getting a job, they want to go rob a liquor store. Instead of staying straight, they go get on drugs again, and they go right back in. But many, many, many of them get out, and they fix their lives. Thank God, because they're out among you and I. And we hope that they follow these, the Ten Commandments. What I want to do now is I'm going to ask you, to break up into little groups. What I'd like to have, if possible, is 10 groups. So if you would just kind of, among yourselves, separate to where you're, there's 10 different groups. I'm going to give you these envelopes. These are the 10 commandments, okay? There's one in each one of these envelopes. I don't know which ones are which. You won't know either. You're going to open it up, take a look at it, read what it says, talk about it among yourselves a little bit, and then we're going to discuss that. Well, I'm going to tell you a couple of things that you can do. Here's the, here's the questions that I've received over and over again. Why do you pray to statues? Okay, we have all these statues. And why do you pray to saints? Why can't you pray directly to God? Two, two answers that work very well. I ask them if they have children. Yes, I do. Or do you have a wife? Yes. You got her picture in your wallet? Yes, I do. Is that your wife? Or is that a picture of your wife? Why do you have that? Do you, is that who you love, the picture? Is that what you're saying? 
they start understanding. The statues are there to remind us, to remind us of who those people are and what they did for us, right? Why do you pray to saints? Most fundamentalists will look at you and they will say, pray for me, I'm going in for an operation. We have a prayer line, call in. So they know that, they, they do that. Pray, pray for me. Well, if you believe in life after death, if you believe in the resurrection and you believe that there are spirits there that have been around for a long time, aren't they the same as you and me? If I ask you to pray for me, can I not also ask my dad, who I believe is still alive, but in spirit, he's been dead since 1999 in body, can I not ask him to pray for me? Dad, I'm going in to have x-rays. Would you pray for me? Same thing. We don't hesitate to ask a person to pray for us. Why should we hesitate to ask a person who happens to be a saint as an in spirit in, to pray for us? We're embodied spirits, meaning our spirit's in our body right now. But that's not always going to be. A hundred years from now, we're all going to be dust. This part of us. But the spirit lives on. That's how you can answer that. So does that make sense? Okay. What do you guys got? Give me an example. Yes. Sunday church. Yep. Traditions within your family. You know, we talked about that. Every Sunday after, after Mass, we like to go to Denny's and have breakfast, and we go home as a family, and we talk together, and we play sports outside, or whatever we do together as a family. We set that day aside, Okay. And it's meant so that we can relax and enjoy what the Lord has given us because Monday is going to roll around and it's back to the grind, whether you're a kid in class or you're working. So those are important times. Lent is a great time. Every day we have, every day you take a breath is the Lord's day. So what this is also saying is live your life to the full. Enjoy every minute of this gift. Enjoy your children. These children are gifts to us just like we are gifts. And someday the gift is going to be given back to the Lord, so enjoy it. What's in the middle? What have we got? Okay. Give me an example of how that could be. What happens? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, there's always older people. There's always younger people. There's always pretty people. There's always not so pretty people. You know, you look at life and you say to yourself, I made a commitment, okay? When we get married, especially in the Catholic Church, we preach this very heavily. We enter into what is called a covenant, a covenant, not a contract of marriage. A contract can be broken. A contract has terms, five years, ten years, X number of dollars. It can be broken. A covenant is not breakable. And so when you're up at the altar and you're being married, okay, you have man and wife and God. You form a triangle. God is here and the, two, the couple is here. That is the strongest, the strongest form. If anybody's an engineer, they know that the triangle is an extremely strong form. Can't be broken. And that's why when Catholics get divorced and they want to remarry, they get annulments because God says you can't break that. You have to find something in that marriage that was not sacramental, that went against canon law. And as soon as you find that, and you find three examples of it, then you have a chance of getting an element so you can be free to marry. Otherwise, you're breaking the covenant. You're committing adultery when you go get married after you've been divorced without coming to the church and getting a decree of nullity. I really don't like the word annulment because it sounds like something civil. The typical question, what about our children? You know, we've been married for 12 years, and now we want to get married to the church, and you say, I have to get an annulment. Does that mean those children are illegitimate? Oh, heck no. See, it's a poor term. Decree of nullity is what it should be called, and what it is called, actually. What do we got on the end? Same one? All the way down? Okay. Does he understand? I bet he does, that little guy. He's a sharp cookie. <laughs> what do you got here? Right here. You shall not take the name of the name of God. Okay. What does that mean to you? Yes. 
Think, think about how awful that is to call God's name down at you. I mean, that's the worst because he's the creator. He, if, if you really thought you could do that, wouldn't that be a horrible power to have, that you could actually do what you're saying? People say GDU all the time. You really understand what you're saying when you say that? Oh, my gosh. And they'll say GD it or whatever. Oh, my gosh. That's, I mean, that's horrible. So that's what that means. What have we got here? Okay, we've talked about that. Can you give me an example of something other than what we've talked about, maybe? Stealing? Let's say you pick up a wallet. Let's say you're dead broke. Let's make it worse. You're, you're almost in foreclosure. And you find a wallet, and in that wallet is $300 cash. And $300 would make a difference in you that would just be unbelievable. And inside that wallet is the guy's driver's license. And you say, finders, keepers? I don't think so. It's your obligation to take that wallet and find that person. That's happened to most of us. And I have a friend, another deacon, who we ride motorcycles together, and he had his backpack on the back of his motorcycle, and he didn't realize it, and it fell off. And inside there was one of these iPads. And he just thought he lost it all. And a neighbor called him and said, there's somebody here at your door. You need to come home. And it was a kid who was about 19 years old that found the backpack and walked to his house and brought that to him. That's what it is. That kid has got it right. He didn't say, you know what, I'm going to take this home. If they find mine, they don't have to worry about a password on it. All you got to do is turn it on, mine. Okay? That kid has it right. What you got over here? Adultery. Okay? All right. That's the other one that breaks up many, many, many homes. It's interesting because, like any other sin, it's redeemable if you don't make it a practice. We've all known people that, I would think, that don't pay attention to that. They just go and do their thing. They just go and have fun. I'm a child of the 60s. If it feels good, do it. Free love, blah, 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 blah. If you are single and there is a man or woman, opposite sex, and you are with them and they're married, who's committing adultery? Just them because they're married? No. If you are single and you are with someone who is divorced and they have not had a decree of nullity, now who's committing adultery? Both of you. Both of you. It's not just the single person that gets off the hook. Well, I'm free. No, you're not. Because we have these Ten Commandments, the basic laws of our church, and we expand from those. They're like a big flower, and they just keep getting bigger and bigger. What have we got down on the end over there? Okay. Does that mean anything? Does that, does that include animals? Really? Really? Well, we'd all be vegetarians. <laughs> I guess kill for a bad thing just to kill. Not to eat, but I mean, just because you want to kill a cat, you just kill it. No. There you go. That's, 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 that's exactly right. Let me ask you a question. Girl is, a woman is, um, just found out she's pregnant. She's single and she has an abortion. Does that fit this? That's killing, isn't it? I had the occasion, my, my 17-year-old daughter went up to Washington, D.C. for the inauguration. And while she's up there, they were at the National Archives, and there was a group protesting for abortion. The sign said, we want abortion now, on demand, without apology. And there was a guy, she's drawn to this because her dad's got gray hair. A guy with gray hair, and she walked up, and she said, what are you doing? And he said, we're protesting, we want abortions now, da, da, da. She said, that's a sin. He said, no, it's not. It's a grown man. No, it's not. She said, why is it not? He said, it's just a fetus. She said, do you know what a fetus is? It's a baby. You are sinning. 
And I said, well, what did he say to you? He, she said, he went, blah, 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 blah. She stopped him cold and she walked away. Now, I don't know what made her do that. But I was at the Catholic, I'm the chaplain for the Catholic Daughters. And last night I said, I think the real reason why she did that is not only what she gets at home, but what she gets right over there in that building with this family, with the family of St. Teresa's, because she's grown up here in this parish. And we cherish that. And she's learned from all of you. So what a beautiful thing. So that, yes, that is killing. It is definitely killing. Okay. Um, what do you got? Okay. Give me an example of um, a way of doing that. What's Other than obeying them and, and um, I mean, you're supposed to wait on them hand and foot? If if your mother tells or or your father tells you to do something that is immoral or illegal, is it honoring them if you do it, or is it honoring them better if you say no? Yes, absolutely. All of us have had times with our parents. You know, parents can be really crazy. I'm a parent. I'm crazy sometimes. You know, but you would never ask your child to do something immoral. You would never ask anybody to do something immoral. That is your sin. They need to have whatever guts it takes to say, no, I can't do that. Hopefully they would be able to do that. You know, we have uh, in our our lives, we have this horrible thing of, of child abuse that happens. It's happened with the clergy. It's happened with teachers. It's happened with policemen. It's happened in families. And I want to talk about families. You have someone who abuses a small child, boy or girl, and then says, don't tell your mother it's our secret. Oh, no, no, no. You have to teach your children that because of the Ten Commandments, that they have the right to speak up, and they can tell you what's going on without any danger. There are some kids who, if they told their parents that an uncle was abusing them, they would get in trouble. I've seen it happen. They get in trouble should never be that way. So teach your children to come to you, that they can come to you for anything and resolve these problems and work them out. Because it can be resolved, it can be worked out, and they should not pay the price for it. The perpetrator should pay the price for it. I don't care if Uncle Billy is the greatest guy, if he's an abuser, that's not a great guy. He's breaking a huge commandment here. It doesn't work just with adults. It goes for these children that we have to protect. So what I want to leave you with tonight is to, is to understand these commandments, look at them, read them, study them a little bit. Look at them in the catechism. That's the best way. And each one is broken down in the catechism. You can get more familiar with it so that you can teach your children what it is. And it'll help you too. It'll help you as well. Even if you know them by heart, it's good to review them and to just kind of revisit them and bring them back into your heart. Any questions or comments at this point? I want to thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. I'm, I appreciate that you tolerated me, and we'll, we'll do this again sometime. And I want to leave you with a little prayer and a blessing, if you don't mind. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for this evening. We hope that your wisdom has come into us. We hope that we have enough, that we can teach our children what we've learned tonight, and that we can expand on it and find more ways of teaching them these Ten Commandments, your basic laws, the Decalogue that you laid down for us, the Mosaic law. Moses, the lawgiver, in his wisdom, brought these down from the mountain, and he led the people, and they became laws that actually govern us today. They govern not only in spiritual law that we talked about tonight, but they govern in civil law. Law is based on these Ten Commandments. They should be outside of every public building because it is the guide for us in our entire life. God, we ask that you give us a safe passage home and that you allow us to keep our hearts open for ourselves, for our spouses, our loved ones, and our children. And I bless you all in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Help me to say the things that you want me to say and not say the dumb things that you don't want me to say and help them to pay attention and remember only the things that are important. 
Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The first devotion we're going to discuss is the sacred heart of Jesus. The reason why Jesus pulls out his heart, and this is a very popular devotion, is because it's the idea that in Judeo-Christian anthropology, especially when a man or a woman says, I give you my heart, they're, they're really saying, I give you everything. I give you all that I am and all that I have, right? And so when Jesus gives us his heart, it, it's really a symbol of him giving himself on the cross, him giving himself to us in the Eucharist. Jesus appeared to this nun named St. Margaret Mary Alacoc, and this is an approved apparition by the church. And he told her that, that my heart, it's pierced with thorns, and I suffer now more than I suffered in my passion. So even though they're beating him black and blue and cutting his body left and right, he said that he was suffering more now because of our lack of love and our lack of devotion, especially in the Holy Eucharist. The two are tied together. So Jesus on the cross, it's God himself giving himself completely to us. Well, then how could he suffer more in the Eucharist? Well, in the Eucharist, it's God himself, really, truly, substantially. The same Jesus who was born in Bethlehem, it's the same Jesus who we receive in Holy Communion, but his heart is broken and it's pierced and it's on fire because we don't act like it. And the way we receive Holy Communion in our devotion it's not there. And so Jesus gave us nine promises. If we had a devotion to a sacred heart and we made him the king of our home and we make Mary the queen of our home. That's why we gave you two eight by tens so that you can go home and you can put up a picture of Jesus in the most prominent part of your house. And then you can get the following promises. So Jesus promised that those who had a devotion to a sacred heart, that he would bring peace into their homes. He promised that if priests encouraged this, that they would have the gift of being able to reach hardened sinners. He also promised that those who had a devotion to his sacred heart and would receive communion on the first Friday of the month for nine months straight, if they received in the state of grace, that they would be guaranteed that they would receive the sacraments at the hour of their death. So Jesus would somehow, with his divine, God the Father's divine providence, would work it out so that just before you die, you'll be able to go to confession and receive Holy Communion, etc., etc. And that's a very, 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 very powerful gift because a lot of times we don't realize that when we die, it's not going to be right before we go to bed and we're saying our prayers. A lot of times it's going to be accidental. It's going to be something very rapid. We don't have time to kind of get our lives together. And so if you're looking for for an easy way to kind of bring peace into the family. Maybe this one family member who's kind of, you know, a little bit angry all the time or they blow up for no reason or there's something spiritually not well. But well, by making Jesus the king of your household and putting the picture up, well, that's an opportunity for, you know, for the devil to officially say, okay, you don't have any place here. This is God's household. Even though we're not perfect, we're doing the best that we can. We have a devotion to Mary's immaculate heart because we say she's immaculate because she didn't commit any sin. And so her heart, if you think about it, if, if Jesus did not have... A, a biological father. St. Joseph was his foster father. That means the DNA of Jesus is the exact same flesh. It's the exact same DNA of the Blessed Mother because he basically just came out of her, right? And so their hearts are so intimately united, especially because she's pure and she'd never committed a single sin. So we say that she has the immaculate heart and it's very sorrowful. It's sorrowful for the same reasons that the Sacred Heart of Jesus is sorrowful. But we even have a greater... And we're, the things that I gave you, if you look at it, there, I gave you a Mary book on the secret of the rosary. I gave you a rosary. I gave I gave you a miraculous medal. I gave you a brown scapular. All of these things are Marian sacramentals. And a lot of times people will misunderstand our relationship with the Blessed Mother. And they'll say, oh, you people, you worship Mary. Why do you have all these statues? Why do you have this and that? And, and to, the, to the untrained eye, that could be like, well, that kind of makes sense. I can see why do we have all this Mary stuff. The guy only gave me one picture of Jesus, right? Well, the reason is because Mary always brings us to Jesus. So God the Father, He decided that the way Jesus was going to come into our lives, the way that grace was going to flow into families and into the world, was going to be through the Blessed Mother. And so the same way, if Jesus is going to come into people's homes and through their hearts, it's going to be through the Blessed Mother. At Pentecost, when the apostles were in the upper room and they're, they're waiting for the Holy Spirit, who was there with them the whole time teaching them how to pray? It was the Blessed Mother was with them. And she'd already received the Holy Spirit in its fullness. So she was there preparing them and helping them. The same way the beloved disciple, he was the only one who made it to the foot of the cross. All the other apostles abandoned Jesus. Why did the beloved disciple make it to the foot of the cross? Because he was there with the Blessed Mother. It's rooted scripturally. But the problem is, is that a lot of times people don't understand how to read the Bible. So we all know that in the book of Genesis, it's the first book of the Bible. It says, and in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God created this and God created that. And on the sixth day and on the seventh day and on this and that. And there's Adam and Eve. And Adam got to name Eve and he called her woman and all these things, right? We, we all kind of basically know that story. Well, in the Gospels, was written to a Jewish community who knew the Scriptures very well. So if I were to start talking about something from the Bible without even telling you what book it was from, they would say, oh, I know that that's from this and this and this, right? So when John wrote his Gospel, he started the Gospel of John out. He, he started writing, he said, 
in the beginning was the Word. And so the first, the first century Jewish person is saying, ah, he's talking about Genesis. And then if you keep reading the Gospel of John, it says, and then on the next day, Jesus did this. And then on the next day, Jesus did that. And then on the next day, Jesus did this. And then on the next day, Jesus did this. And on the third day, Jesus did this. So if you count them up, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and add three to four, okay, that's seven days. So John is starting to parallel what's going on in the Old Testament. And then, so what is happening on the seventh day? Well, they're having a wedding feast. And, and Mary says, they have no more wine. And Jesus replies, woman, what business is this of mine? It's not even my hour. That's the way we read it. Like, we're just listening to it. That's, that's the way it looks. Like, woman? Man, this guy just called his mom a woman. And for the first time I read that, I was like, telling my mom, I was like, woman? And she was like, don't you call me woman? I was like, hey, I'm just doing like Jesus, man. Calm down. But in reality, what's really happening is that Jesus is the new Adam. He's fixing everything that Adam did wrong, right? And in, so in the book of Genesis, Adam calls Eve woman. And what is Jesus doing? Jesus is calling Mary the new Eve woman. How is Mary the new Eve? Well, Eve listened to the devil. And what happened? Because she disobeyed God, she brought sin and death to the world. But Mary listened to the good angel, the angel Gabriel. And what did she do? She brought life and grace into the world. Eve tempted Adam to do the first sin, to, to eat the apple, right? Well, at the wedding feast at Cana, what is Mary doing? Mary is tempting Jesus, the new Adam, to do the first glorious miracle, right? So she's interceding. Like, why in the Bible does it say pray to Mary? Right there, Jesus says, it was not my hour. What business is this of mine? And Mary says, do whatever he tells you. He's not going to be, I'm the mom here. You ain't going to get away with that, man. And so then he does the first miracle with that. And so what does that mean? It, that means God is willing to change change his plans based on what his mother is asking of him. It wasn't his plan to do that. But she just went ahead and said, do this. You're going to do this because I'm your mother. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's all. We have to talk about that. Like a good son, he obeys, right? And so then if you look at, this is a famous, you know, everybody here in our country has, knows of who Our Lady Guadalupe is. If you don't know who she is, if you don't know the story, you at least know the image, right? At the same time that Our Lady was appearing here in the Americas, well, in Europe, the Protestant Reformation was happening. And what's the Protestant Reformation? That's when, because everybody was Catholic for the first 1,500 years of Christianity. And then all of a sudden, somebody said, I don't want to do that. I don't believe the way this is interpreted. And then, and so then what happened? One million people left the Catholic Church. But at the same time, Mary appears to Juan Diego, and within one year, how many people convert to Catholicism? Five million so Mary's always bringing people to Jesus. That is her role. That is what she does. And in the Bible, there, it, it, we could go into all the scriptural verses. There's so many. And I actually have a presentation that I made that's only 11 minutes long. But her role is to crush the head of the, of the devil. Mary said, yes, fiat, let it be done to me according to your word. At that point, the devil was beat. Why? Because once Jesus came on the scene, God's not going to fail against the devil. The devil is a creature of God. God created the devil, right? So he's not going to lose. The second that Mary said, let it be done to me according to your word, that was the turning point. Th what Eve did wrong, Mary undid. And then through Jesus, that's where we have our salvation because he's God. Of course, God made man. And so in the book of Genesis, that there's going to be enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. And if you look at the book of Revelation, it also says that there was a, a woman and she had offspring and the dragon was making war against the woman and her children. And we are her children, by the way. Mary's role is to crush the head of the devil. And so that's what's going to happen at all times. So then who does the devil hate more than anybody? Who beat the devil? A 13-year-old girl, not even a butch, tough girl. But a 13-year-old little girl beat the devil. That's the greatest insult that there could possibly be. So who does the devil hate more than anybody? Well, he hates women more than anybody. That's why the greater the sins, the sins are primarily always against women. Women are the ones who are being degraded. Women are the ones who are being sex trafficked. Women are, all these, are always being put down because he hates women more. But who does he hate above all women? He hates the Blessed Virgin Mary. And that's why so many times the Protestants will say, Ah, you worship Mary. Ah, da, 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 da. And if you think about it, the differences that we have between Catholicism and their faith, we believe that a little piece of bread is God. For if I was going to be against the Catholic Church, I'd be against that part. That's crazy. That's nuts. But instead, what do they focus on? They focus on the Blessed Mother. Why? Because that's what the devil want, hates the most. And, and she's the one who can bring us 
closer to God. And so if you look at what, what I gave you here, this is the one that, oh, I hate that rosary. Oh, don't wear your rosary. Oh, and, and why? Why don't we wear the rosary? We can wear the rosary, man. I, I, I'm not wearing it right now, but I normally wear a rosary tied around my wrist. Why would the devil hate the rosary so much? Because what is it really? It, 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 yes, it's a bunch of Hail Marys and Our Fathers. That's true. But really, it's a mini Bible. How is it a mini Bible? Well, first of all, all the prayers that we say in the rosary come 100% straight from the Bible. The Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That's straight from the Gospel of Matthew. That was Jesus came up with the, the Our Father. The Hail Mary. Where do we get the Hail Mary from? Straight from the Gospel of Luke. Who said Hail Mary? Who's the first one? The angel Gabriel said Hail Mary because that was the message that God the Father had. He said, Hail, full of grace. And then who said, Blessed art thou amongst women? That was also the Gospel of Luke. That's straight from the Bible. Elizabeth said, Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, because you have believed what the Lord God has revealed to you. All from the Bible. This is not a problem. Okay, now if you look, if you get your rosary out, and then you, we have this little pamphlet here. If you open up the pamphlet, and you look at all the pretty pictures... We have the four mysteries. What's the first mystery? The Annunciation. The angel Gabriel appears to Mary. The second mystery. Mary visits Elizabeth. The third mystery. Jesus is born. The fourth mystery. Jesus is presented the temple. The fifth mystery. Jesus is a child is found in the temple. The first luminous mystery. Jesus is an adult now and he's baptized. The second luminous mystery. Jesus is now going to the wedding feast of Cana. The third luminous mystery. Jesus is now proclaiming the kingdom of God. The fourth. Now Jesus transfiguration. The fifth. Now the institution of the Eucharist. And then the awful. Then what happens? Jesus is agony in the garden. Then he's forged at the pillar. Then he's crowned with thorns. Then he's carrying the cross. Then he's crucified. And then he resurrects from the dead. This is all the Bible. This is the mini Bible. The whole Bible is contained here. But the, and a lot of times when we pray the rosary, we don't pray it right. Why do you mean we don't pray it right? I say our fathers, say Hail Mary. Come on. That's, but that is just saying a bunch of our fathers and a bunch of Hail Marys. The purpose and, and what the rosary really is, it's three different types of prayer. It's vocal prayer. Yes, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed. Those, that's a vocal prayer. But more importantly, it, or equally importantly, it's meditative prayer where we're actually thinking about things like we don't think about, like we said earlier, if I'm, if I'm not thinking about my wife and my wife is, I'm out of town for an entire year and I don't look at her picture and I don't think about our wedding and I don't think about all the times we spent together, well, my faith and my relationship with her is going to go weaker and colder every single the, the day goes by, right? But by praying the rosary, the whole point is that when we do each of these little off-colored, on my rosary, the red beads, are, I say in Our Father. But before that, I look and say, okay, I'm on the first mystery, that's the Annunciation. So the, the angel Gabriel announced to Mary, and then there's a scripture verse there. And then what do I do? Then I, I try to do my best to think about that, and then I say ten Hail Marys, but, but the goal is to think about it. And then the same way, the next one. So after I'm done with that, then what do I do? Then I think about how Mary visited Elizabeth, and then I pray ten Hail Marys. Now, and it's deeper than that. Because it, it, it leads us into contemplation. So the reason, and it's beautiful, we have a great devotion to the, to the Bible. Not only is it our source for the life of Jesus, but also because it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. So when you pray with it and you read it slowly, even though your brain might be foggy and not focused when you start, if you start doing it slowly, like if you've ever picked up the Bible sometimes by yourself at night and you start to read it and start, and start to go on in your heart, a lot of times maybe prisoners will be in there or maybe you're in a hotel room and somebody will be about to commit suicide and they read the Bible very slowly. And what happens is that something happens inside of them, even though they're not really focused and they don't know the story that well, the Holy Spirit still works and they have an encounter with God through that. So when you start to pray your rosary, yeah, you're starting off just saying vocal prayers, but that's because we need something to get us going in the right direction. And then we try to do our best to think about what's going on in these mysteries. But then more importantly is you, you begin by the time you're done with one rosary, at some point you, you begin to encounter the one you're thinking about. So maybe you'll be there praying the rosary and you'll be praying the sorrowful mysteries and you'll be at, you'll be at the crucifixion and the whole time you can't focus and then all of a sudden you, you look at the crucifixion and you see, you, you remember that Jesus had said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And then all of a sudden something happens inside of your heart and you think about how, you know, you're really irritated at your husband, you're really irritated at your children for something and then somehow something happens and it, it, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. In our hearts we feel the same way. We've like, I should really forgive them because he doesn't really know what he's doing. He comes home, he doesn't realize that I'm here working all day. They don't, you know, so, and we change a little bit. And, and that's what where power lies. Because it is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Now, it's not just that. So if the devil wanted you to not do one thing, he doesn't want you to think about Jesus. If it, so if he wanted you to do one thing, what did he want you to do? Don't pray the rosary. So what is his temptation? Don't pray it right now. I, I have a priest friend who's an exorcist, and when he was doing an exorcism is when there's a bad spirit 
controlling the body of a person, and the priest has the power to get that bad spirit out. And when he was exercising this person, he asked him, he said, in the name of Jesus, you tell me, how do you get so many souls to go to hell? What's your trick? Is it pornography? Is it drugs? What is it? And the, and the guy under the influence of the devil, he said, I just tell them tomorrow. Do it later. And then the priest was shocked. He was like, what? Tomorrow? And then he sat back and he, he, he was praying and he thought about it. He's like, that makes so much sense. People will say, oh, I'll go to confession tomorrow. Oh, I'll go to mass tomorrow. Oh, I'll pray the rosary later tonight. Oh, I'll pray tomorrow. And then by the time it's nighttime, we're all falling asleep. And then, oh, I'll pray with my kids tomorrow. And by the time you pray with your kids, they're already grown up and they don't want to pray with you anymore. So the devil's trick is to get us to pray it later. Don't do it right now. But guess who crushes the head of the Satan? It's the Blessed Mother. So if you open up your pamphlet... Okay, where's my paper? In there, there's a, a, a little card called the 15 Promises. There's mine. So earlier I said that you know Jesus has promises that to get us to put these things up on our house. To, just the same way the Blessed Mother has promises. I like to think of her as the great fisherwoman. She gives us all these things. And this is another beautiful thing about the Blessed Mother. Is that every time she legitimately appears, she gives us something tangible. Because we're, we're, we're physical. We're, we're body and soul united. We need something tangible to hang on to. Like, like we said earlier, if I don't have a picture of my wife, I don't have a picture of the one I love, it doesn't mean I worship them, even though I have their picture. If I was, you know, we don't worship the Statue of Liberty. We have a Statue of Liberty, right? But the same way, if I don't have a picture of somebody reminding me, well, what happens? I forget. So the Blessed Mother's tricky, and we're dumb, and she bribes us, just like any good mother does. You want to clean, clean the dishes, okay, clean your room, and I'll you know, let you have allowance. When I was a kid, the only allowance I got, I was allowed to go outside. That was the only allowance I had. So the Blessed Mother is much better than that. So the 15 promises, let's go through a couple of these promises. And this is for people who pray the rosary every day. So the first promises. The first promise says, Whoever shall faithfully serve me by the recitation of the rosary shall receive signal graces. A signal grace is like a sign. When, you need, when there's a, a turn signal, you turn, right? So a lot of times we'll be asking, God, I wish I knew what I should do. Should I quit my job or should I go work over here or should I move? Should I do this and that? Should I stay with this person? Should I not? Should I put my kids in private school? Should I put them over here? Should I homeschool? What should I do? And you don't know what to do, but Mary's promising you that if you pray the rosary every day and you have an intention, that she will give you a signal grace. She will give you direction. Something will happen where you'll be like, no, don't do that. Or yes, do that. It's very simple. For example, I was praying about whether or not I should give you this pamphlet. And in my heart, I kind of felt like, well, should I? Should I not? Oh, I don't know. It's all folded, wrinkled. I don't know. It's ugly. It's the ugliest thing that there is here in in all honesty. And I was like, okay, Lord, if you want me to do it, you better, you know, knock on my head because my head's like a coconut. It's very empty inside, right? And so when I came up here, there, there was a small little group of kids sitting here and the, Paul, the guy who's in charge of CC or whatever, was up here with them. And then there was a woman in the back and it was the woman who gave me these pamphlets and I hadn't seen her in like six months. And then so I was like, okay. And then I was rational. I was like, well, that's just a coincidence. And I was like, no, 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 no. I'll go get it. And so those, that's just a little, little example. That's just, these things happen every day. That's just the most recent one that has happened. So that's an example of a signal grace. The second, I promise my special protection and the greatest graces to all of those who shall recite the rosary. Special protection. We need special protection. One time when, uh, well, I'll, there's two examples that I'll give you from my personal life. Well, when, when we first had my son, we got, and I pray the rosary every day, and at the time my wife did not, so I was like, praying it and trying to convince her because I heard about the talk and she didn't, but you know, now she does. But anyway, so we first got back from the hospital, we're living in an apartment and we're watching something on television and then somebody's knocking on the door. Boom, boom, boom. It's like, yes. And then so it was some guy, a maintenance man saying, we're here to assess the damage. And I was like, what damage, man? And he's like, well, all the apartments are here flooded because pipes burst. And I said, no, mine's not flooded. He's like, let's go check your bathroom. And there was a little puddle of water. I said, oh, I thought my wife peed on the floor. She's pregnant. I don't know. You know, we just had a baby. I thought that was water broke or whatever. And he's like, no, it's from the pipes. And so everybody else in the entire complex, well, in our little unit, they had to have all their appliances removed and the carpets changed. And we didn't have to. And we just had a child. And then later on, shortly after, during Hurricane Ike, I was, again, I was praying multiple at this point. And then I was like, oh, special protection. Thank you, Lord. A hurricane's coming. I'm going to have special protection. But my wife, who is, who is a convert from uh, being a Baptist, she was like, well, my parents, they live in uh, Tomball. They have a big house there. We shouldn't stay here. We live in an apartment. It's not good. We're over here on the Beltway. It's not safe. And I said, yes, but your parents are not Catholic. 
They don't have the protection from praying the rosary. I should stay in my house. And then, of course, she wins because she's the woman. And, you know, the women just have a way of getting what they want sometimes. And so we went over there. And what happened? A tree went through the house. And it, a power line got knocked down. They didn't have electricity for like two weeks. And then I was, that, that happened on the Saturday. And then on Monday, I was like, forget this. I'm going to my apartment. I got to my apartment. There was electricity. The air conditioning was working. I went and I opened the freezer. And the only thing that was there was blood from a steak that we had in the freezer. And it was bloody there. And I closed it. I was like, I'm going to tell my wife to clean that up. I ain't going to clean that up. And then well, my, I called my wife. And I was like, oh, look, this is working. Come over. And then she said, okay, I'm coming. And then what happened when she got there? I said, look, it's working. And then I went, took a nap, got back up, opened the freezer. I was going to see if it was still dirt bloody. And I was like, oh, it's clean. She cleaned it up. And I was like, thanks for cleaning it up. She's like, cleaning what up? I was like, the blood in the freezer. And she said, I didn't clean that up. I was waiting to see if you'd do it. And I was like, wow, who cleaned up the blood in the freezer? You've been home the whole time. I was like, yeah, I've been home the whole time. Right? And so the blood was even cleaned up from the freezer because I was even complaining. I was like, oh, there's blood in here. Tell them about special protection, huh? Right? Another important individual that everybody recognizes, Pope John Paul II. That, that man was so devoted to the Blessed Mother. And I gave you a little book somewhere. I don't know where my copy is. Oh, it's over here. I don't know where it is. It's called Our Lady of Fatima's Peace Plan from Heaven. And it just gives you an overview of what happened at Fatima. But one of the things that was predicted was that one of the little children, the Blessed Mother told her that the Pope was going to be killed because, you know, because of all these things and wars, etc., etc., and a lot of what I have to do has to do with Fatima, so it's good that you kind of pick that up and look at it. But, and this happened, and this was predicted on May 13th. She said the Pope will be killed, right? To the day, May 13th, but Pope John Paul II listened to the Lady of Fatima. He prayed the rosary every day. He wore the brown scapular. But what happened on that day? Well, he, he saw a little girl, and she had a statue of Our Lady of Fatima, and she knelt down to kiss the statue, and all of a sudden, psh, 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 and the, the, the assassinator, Mehmet Ali Aja, had shot the Pope, but he didn't die. And he shot him from like not even four feet away. And he shot him directly. The guy was so shocked. And the bullet went in right here, made a 90 degree right turn, went forward, made another 90 degree left turn, and went straight out of his back. And the, so the bullet went around his major organs, and it came out and he was alive. And, and you could see him, there's pictures of like him laying in the hospital bed. He even said, he said, I knew I was going to live. I knew that one person was pulling the trigger, but another finger was directing where the bullet was going. And it happened on the exact day. He knew it was Our Lady of Fatima. And that's why he was so devoted to the Immaculate Heart of Mary and praying the rosary regularly. And so, that's special protection. And you know the way things are going right now with, you know, international with the nuclear war possibilities and biological warfare and so many people are willing to die to kill Christians and to kill Americans. It's just a matter of time that we need our own special protection, right? And so we should be praying the rosary every day. Number three, the, sh- the rosary shall be a powerful armor against hell. It will destroy vice, it will decrease sin, and it will defeat heresies. The number one problem facing all of our families, the reason that there's brokenness in our family, number one reason is because of sin. Either somebody's not being merciful, somebody's committing some sin, somebody's being selfish, somebody's being lustful, somebody's being gluttonous, somebody's being lazy. But that's the reason why there's always friction in our family. And so by praying the rosary every day, Mary promises to help decrease sin and destroy vice. When I was teaching, I was teaching uh, middle school. In my first year teaching, I gave out 98, and I was teaching math, I gave out 98 referrals. A referral is when I'd write a letter to the vice principal. The vice principal would sign it. They send it home to the parents. Parents have to sign it, bring it back. And then they switched me over to religion, and we're like, we're praying the rosary. I convinced the kids to pray the rosary. They were all about the rosary. Some of them, a couple of them weren't. And I only gave out five referrals the next year. And then the, the third year that I had those kids, was, they were already wanting to pray the rosary because of all the miracles that they were receiving and all the gifts that they were getting. And so I gave out zero referrals. I even changed my rules. I said, if I have to talk to you three times in one week, if you distract me on Monday and you distract me on Thursday and you distract me on Friday, then you get a referral. So if you fart on Monday, if you cough on Wednesday, and they still, not a single one, got in trouble. They were perfect. And the principal would come and say, hey, can you get the kids to do this and that? Can you get the kids to line up? Can you? It's like, why are you asking me? You're the principal. It's like, because they always listen to you. And that's, it's the rosary. I try to convince them. So it will, I guarantee you, I, if, you could only, if you only knew the way that these children changed, whew, it's crazy. For example, like, I, I, it wasn't very nice to me, but I have one of my old students' book, The Secret of the Rosary. Look at this book. This is not mandatory reading. They re- this girl read this thing left and right, back and forth, nonstop. 
Number four, I will cause virtue and good work to flourish. I will obtain for souls the abundant mercy of God. I will withdraw the hearts of men from the love of the world and its vanities. And I will lift them to desire eternal things. And then she desires that souls would make themselves holy by this means. Number five, the soul which recommends itself to me by the recitation of the rosary shall not perish. So that's good. We don't want to perish. Number six, whoever shall recite the rosary devoutly, applying himself to the consideration of its sacred mysteries shall never be conquered by misfortune. And this is very, 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 very important. God will not chastise him in his justice. He shall not per- perish by an unprovided death. If he be just, he will remain in the grace of God and become worthy of eternal life. God will not chastise him in his justice. One of the things that is discussed in that little book, the Our Lady's Peace Plan from Heaven, is that one of the ways that God allows us to be punished, it's not like he's like, oh, you're bad. I'm striking you by lightning. Oh, you're ugly. Okay, you're going to get smashed by the car. No, he allows us to suffer the consequences of my sin. That, that's how God punishes us. The consequence is already built in. So if there's chaos in the world, it's because there's chaos in a country. It's because there's chaos in a family. And then it's because there's chaos in an individual, right? So God naturally, so the consequence of me committing adultery against my spouse, what's the consequence of that? Well, my spouse hates me. My children, she never doesn't trust me after that. Of course, she's not going to want to, you know, be intimate or things like that. My children are heartbroken. So there's natural consequences that are built into that. Well, the same way Our Lady at Fatima, she said that the consequence that God's going to allow, His just chastisement, is war. And she predicted to the exact date, and you can look in that book that I gave you, to the exact date, the beginning of World War II. And she predicted that Russia would spread its errors and communism, etc., etc. And so, what, but what, why do I bring that up? If she, she predicted the exact date of World War II, what bad thing happened be, at World War II besides the Jewish people getting put in the concentration camps? Well, also, what happened? The atomic bomb, two of, dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And, and it was devastating. Except... In Hiroshima, there was a small convent of Jesuit priests. There were six of them there. And their, their house where they were staying was eight blocks, less than one mile from ground zero where the atomic bomb was blasted. And you can see everything around is all dust, all dirt, all ashes, except where the priests were staying. And the, four, the six priests are like waving up their hands like this to the helicopter that's flying by taking a picture. And they didn't have any radiation. They didn't have any broken bones. They didn't have any scratches. And they asked them, why? Why do you think you're alive and everybody around you is dust? Because we prayed the rosary every single day as a community. And the same thing in Nagasaki, the uh, conventual friars of St. Maximilian Kolbe, they were there and they were the only ones within several miles who survived and they didn't have any radiation, any broken bones, any cuts, any anything. Again, for the same reason, they, they attested it to doing the daily adoration and then doing a daily rosary. With the rosary is only 15 minutes. Number seven, whoever shall have a true devotion to the rosary shall not die without the sacraments of the church. That's important. Number eight, those who are faithful to recite the rosary shall have during their life and at the, their death the light of God and the plenitude of his grace. And at the moment of death, they shall participate in the merits of saints in, in paradise, which is great. One of the, the saints, I forget his name, St. Dominic Savio, he was 14 years old. He was a, a student of St. John Bosco, and he died at the age of 14. And he appeared afterwards to St. John Bosco, and St. John Bosco said, What was death like? You died so slow and agonizing. And he said, Oh, it was terrible. I would have, I would have uh, committed despair. I would have despaired of my salvation had I not prayed the rosary every single day. And then if you think about what we're saying when we say the Hail Mary, we're asking Mary to pray for us. Help, full of grace, Lord, is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now. So right now we're getting grace. And at the hour of our death. So if we're praying this every day, 50 times, and you say that every day for, for 356 or 65, I don't remember how many days are in a year, times 350, and then you multiply that times 50 years, by the time you die, at the hour of your death, you're going to be getting hundreds of thousands of Hail Marys right at that exact moment. That's going to be so beautiful. It'll be so nourishing. It'll make you feel so good. You'll be like, oh, I'm not afraid. I might have done so many bad things, but look at all my Hail Marys. And then in this book that I gave you, oh, this book is so good. It's so good, man. This book is like the, the, everything that could be said about the rosary, except what I'm saying about it, because it was written like 500, 400 years ago. It's, it's there. For example, this, this is just backing up what I say. This is written by St. Louis de Montfort. If you say the rosary faithfully until death, I do assure you that in spite of the gravity of your sins, you shall receive a never-fading crown of glory. Even if you are on the brink of hell, even if you have one foot in hell, and even if you've sold your soul to the devil as sorcerers do practice black magic, and even if you are a heretic as obstinate as the devil, sooner or later you will be converted, and you will amend your life, and you will save your soul if you say your holy rosary devoutly every day until death. It guarantees it. 
You could even dare people, okay, man, I'll give you $100 if you say rosary every day for a month. And if you get converted in a month, I'll give you another 100 And then what happens? They'll be converted every single time. I had the worst, the worst kids in my class. Kids, it was so hard to like those kids. Oof. I was like, Lord, help me like this poor child. He was so... Oof. How am I going to say their names? Because you might know them. <laughs> Number nine. I shall deliver from purgatory those who have been devoted to the rosary. That's awesome. Purgatory is painful. So you don't have to worry about your purgatory. Man, she's making this like an easy deal. Number 10, the faithful children of the rosary shall merit a high degree of glory in heaven. Number 11, this is my favorite. You shall obtain some of what you ask. No, it doesn't say some. You shall obtain all. Obtain what? I shall, you shall obtain all. 99% or 100%. All. The paper, the Mary said all. Okay, so you shall obtain all you ask of by the recitation of the rosary. All. Unless, there's always a stipulation, unless God has something better for you planned or whatever you asked for is so sinful and ridiculous that you're not going to get it. And what I did was, because I was learning with my students as well, I I gave them an assignment for bonus points. I, I said, if you've ever made a deal with the Blessed Mother, can you please give me an example of what your deal was and how it turned out? And 33 kids ended up saying, oh yeah, I made a deal with the Blessed Mother. And every single one of those 33, they got exactly what they asked for because they're persistent. For example, the one I, I just taught a CCE class, and this kid walked in, and he was like, I want a cell phone, man. I hate my cell phone. I want a cell phone. And then, so I told him the story about this girl that I had in my class. She wanted a new cell phone. This was back when the iPhone had just come, come out, and so she wanted to have MP3. She wanted to have a camera on her phone. And so she's like, Dad, please, I beg you, I want a cell phone. And then she said, no, of course you can't have a cell phone. And then she's like, please, Dad, I want a cell phone. He's like, okay, well, if you go to the tournament in tennis. And she's like, we're never going to go to the tournament in tennis. We're, we're not good in tennis. Right? And then so she said, okay, Mary, I will pray the rosary three times a day, every day for three weeks. And then if I get my cell phone, I'll pray it every day for the rest of my life. Please, I want my cell phone. And if you think about that, that Mary's got that kid in her hand. Mmm, this is easy. You get a cell phone, I get your soul. Yeah, you're dumb. You took the bait, man. All right. So what happened? She prayed it every day, three times a day. Tournament time comes. What happened? Her tournament team, new territory, did not go to the playoffs. No cell phone for you. And then, but by that time, she was already so converted. She'd even said, she even wrote this in her paper. I was there praying, and I said, you know, it's probably better that I didn't have that phone. And I'm going to still pray at least one rosary every day for the rest of my life because just th- her life was turning out so much better. And then what happened? That right after she had made that prayer, the phone rang, and it was a coach from First Colony. And he said, hey, your uh, team's out of the playoffs. Can you play on our team? One of our people rolled their ankle. And then so what happened? She got her cell phone after all. Wow. And then there was this boy. Please, I'll do anything. Just pray the rosary, man. Pray it. Just give me one week of the rosary. I was like, what do you want? You've got to want something. I want a boat. A boat? I can't. You, you can just sin with a boat, man. Give me something. I was like, why do you want a boat? Because I want to go fishing. I was like, why? Do He's like, Mr. C, you get me a big fish, and I'll pray the rosary every day. And I was like, all right. And then so I just kind of forget about it. I was like, I'll pray for you, man. Good luck with that. So then he said that he woke up Saturday morning at 4.45 in the morning. He said he prayed the rosary, and then he, he came back to school Monday, and this kid was a big kid. Like, he's like my height, and this is only an eighth grader, really big. And he showed me a picture, and he was standing like this with a giant catfish, and I'm not kidding. It was like this big. You couldn't even barely see the top of his head, and he's like falling over. And, and he's like, Mrs. Gidry, check this out. I got a fish, pray the rosary. Right? It worked. I'm not kidding you. I wouldn't be telling you. I wouldn't be make, how could I make that story up? And then there was, and, and so the kids were becoming very converted. And we had one girl in there. Her, her family was having so many financial problems. She prayed the rosary during recess like this with her arms out. And after one or two minutes, let me tell you what, that starts to hurt. I always put my arms down at the glory be if I'm ever doing it. Cause they're make, this is a girl. So I was like, okay, you, I'm tougher than you. <laughs> and I was like, I'm putting them down at the glory be. This hurts. Right? And she would just man up the whole time. Then we'd do the intentions, what we were praying for. And she'd just be like... And then one day, she, I was like, you never say what you want. Like, what, just like, I'm just praying for everybody else. I was like, well, what, ask for something. You're, you're getting credit for it. Mary wants us to ask for stuff. And she's like, I want it to snow. I was like, snow? You can't snow. And then but she's like, you said I could ask for anything. And then so I was like, Mary, we're not, no, you're not going to have anybody praying the rosary. People want boats. They want snow. 
And then so that afternoon, I went to my teacher's meeting, and th- we praised the, the faculty, and they're like, okay, anybody have any intentions? Oh, yeah, somebody's sick. And I was like, I got an intention. I promised this girl that it was going to snow, or she's not going to pray anymore. And then we heard this screaming in the hallway, ah, it's snowing, ah! It was snowing. I'm not kidding. And then I gave a talk here to the life team uh, like two years later. I gave that as an example. And then the next week I came back because they were going to go on a retreat together. And we didn't go because it was snowing. And that kid was praying really hard for snow too. I don't know why. Don't pray for snow, please. It's October. (laughs) But I'm just telling you that persist. It's not going to cause you to sin. Don't give up. And the Blessed Mother will take care of you. She's never failed me yet. Unless I quit. And I haven't quit yet. So number 12... All of those who propagate the Holy Rosary shall be aided by me in their necessity. So anybody who encourages the Rosary, so if you're promoting it, even by p- praying it publicly so people can see you praying it, well, Mary's going to help you in all of your necessities. What are your necessities? Oh, you need a beautiful girlfriend. Oh, you need help paying the bills. Oh, you want your football team to win. All right. God takes sides. I'm telling you. If your team prayed more, you'd probably win. And if maybe, I don't know, maybe not. We'll see what God has planned. Number 13, I have obtained from my divine son that all advocates of the rosary shall have for their intercessors the entire celestial court during... Okay, so all, basically you get the idea. She's willing to do anything it takes because of the power to convert. And so my recommendation to you is whenever you're praying the rosary, somehow try whatever mystery it is, somehow try to tie in whatever your intention is. So for example, if you wanted, if you wanted a cell phone for some reason, or maybe, I don't know, maybe there's communication problems in your relationship... Your intention could be for the Annunciation, where the angel Gabriel announced to Mary, it's a blessed mother, the angel Gabriel communicated to you. And you said, okay, you are humble. Please help communication between me and my husband. Help him to be humble because his head is so thick. He doesn't listen. So that could be your intention. It works. I promise you it works, especially if you don't give up. And especially if you pray it together. And that's why the, the, there's a saying, the family that prays together stays together. Now, I gave you a book. This book is gold. I gave you this book. Why? Because it is that good. You know how you can tell if a book is good? If you open it and you start to read it a little bit and you keep reading because whatever was re- you were reading catches your attention. That's how you know a book is good. This book is like that. And, and if for some reason, and this is, the way I, this is the way I read when I do it like that. Because it's not like a book you want to read straight through. Maybe you do. I don't know. When I read, it's like, that looks boring. I skip it. That looks good. Mm, I'm going to read that. This looks boring, skip it. And then what's going to happen is one day when you pick it up, the parts that look boring to you, for some reason they don't look boring, and for some reason the parts that looked interesting to you before, they were boring to you this time. So this book, I'm telling you, it's gold. Every time I'm like, I don't want to pray the rosary. If you ever don't want to pray the rosary, look at this book, and you'll be like, I better pray the rosary. This is good stuff, man. It's it's gold. It's gold. Love it. That's great. That's awesome. Now... Now we have other gifts. The, 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 like I said, the Blessed Mother always gives stuff. So the, I'm wearing a big one. It's called the Miraculous Medal. In 1830, and again in the Church of Proved Apparition, she appeared to St. Catherine Labore, and she's always trying to teach us something about God, and this is a great one. And if you look at your little pamphlet, you can look, or you can look at the medal you have, and she told Catherine to have a medal made after this image. And so she appeared like this, with rays coming out of her hands. And on the medal, I can't read that one, it's too small. O Mary, conceive without sin, pray for us who have recourse to you. And it shows Mary standing on top of a globe, which is the earth, because she's the queen of heaven and earth. And she has her foot standing on top of a snake. And it has the year 1830, because that's the year that it happened. And then if you flip it over, it shows the M intertwined with the cross, because Mary was there at the foot of the cross. It has 12 stars for the 12 apostles and for the 12 tribes of Israel. It has the sacred heart and the immaculate heart side by side. And so what, what is this? This is a mini catechism. This is a mini gospel. Why is Mary stepping on the head of the serpent? Because she's the new Eve. Eve was the one who was deceived by the serpent. But Mary is the one who crushed his head. And so this is like, you've, you've heard that parable, oh, the, the, the gospel is like a seed. And there's rocky soil. And then there's uh, weeds. And then there's thorns. And sometimes the seed falls on good soil. And sometimes it, it gets planted and then... The birds of the air, the devil comes and takes the faith away from the person, or maybe their faith isn't strong. Well, this seed is the gospel, and it's made out of metal. And it has the power not only to give you special graces, but also to convert people. It's called the silver bullet. And so what happens if it's a seed, and then the devil comes? The Blessed Mother is going to hit the devil with her broom and knock them away. But if you, if you can, if you, one, you wear this, you'll never lose your faith. 
And there's stories in that little pamphlet of how people who were like wore it as a dare was converted and they became priests. St. Maximilian Kolbe, Mother Teresa as well. She, Mother Teresa would carry around 3,000 miraculous medals everywhere she went. If she wanted something, she wanted property, she wanted that land over there, and she'd have no money. Of course, she's poor. She'd go and she'd, she'd say, can I have your property? We need it for my sisters. And they say, oh, no way. You got any money? You're not going to pay for it? Get out of here. Are you crazy? And then she said, okay, I tried to tell you. And then she'd go and put all the medals in, in, the, in, the, in the dirt. And then she'd come back, and three weeks later, hey, can I have that property now? Oh, yeah, yeah, you can have it. It's yours. And then they just give it to her. And so she just give these things out. And Mary promised that anybody who wore this around their neck would receive great graces and it would be a sign for them that she's always with them and helping them and interceding for them. And so that's why I wear a big one. So I was like, okay, I don't forget and you don't forget. And anytime I get in trouble, I'm like, okay. Like I go into, I go into my, because I work here with Father Reynolds and it's like, he calls me into the office and I don't know, he doesn't tell me. He's like, can we have a meeting? Can you come in here and talk to me at two o'clock? He doesn't tell me why. And he knows that I hate that because like, I worry. I was like, oh, did I do something? I did something. I bet I did something. I'm in trouble. So I'd be in there like, all right, how's it going, Father? <laughs> like holding this. And they'd be like, uh, can you send so-and-so an email? I was like, that's what you called me in here for. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I just walk out holding this. If you get in trouble, it's like, what's up, Mom? Yeah, I didn't do the dishes. I broke the dishwasher. You going to punish me? No, oh, I have to wash them by hand. Oh, see ya. Okay, I'll do that. Right? And so, I, it, the greatest graces, I promise, it works every time. And you'll be surprised. You'll be surprised. And then, I'm giving you something even bigger. Where's the other bigger, better? Oh, this is beautiful. But if, I, if, I, if, I, if I wasn't wearing this microphone, I'll still go ahead and show you. I'm going to give you a brown scapular. Where's my brown scapular? I'm sure you're wearing two of them. Yeah, I'm wearing two. Yeah, there we go. There's the medals. More medals. Got a brown scapular there. Got a brown scapular there. I'm wearing two brown scapulars. <laughs> just in case one breaks. Or just in case somebody falls over dead and they need my other one. And I got so many medals. Like, could, I'm gonna be the, like, could you imagine I don't go to heaven when I die? I'm going to be like, hey, man, I'm the only person in hell wearing scapulars and medals. Man, let me out. <laughs> it's not going to happen. They won't do that. Nobody would ever wear medals again if that were the case, right? And so, anyways, let me, sorry about that, guys. That's good enough. I'll just open like this, after hours, right? So the brown scapular, again, Mary, she always gives us tangible things. Why? Because we need reminders. We need reminders. In this book, as an example, there's like, I forget what page it is. But did you know you get a partial indulgence for wearing your rosary as a holy reminder? Because sometimes people say, look, you're wearing your rosary as a holy reminder. You get grace for that. An indulgence is when you have all of your purgatory taken away. A partial indulgence is when you get a little bit of your purgatory taken away. And you can get partial indulgence for making the sign of the cross, for wearing your rosary, for kissing your scapular. There's many different ways. But it's, it, it's a blessing to wear your rosary and have your rosary with you. Why? Because the devil hates this. Well, then why do those gangsters wear it? And if you have to realize, if the devil is all about perversion... Could you imagine he's probably laughing? Those people don't even realize the one thing that can save their soul is around their neck. And he's so dumb that all you have to do is say, Hey, man, you know how to pray that rosary? What, this is, pray, what, what, what? And then you say, Yeah, I'll use our Father Hail Mary, man. You should try it out. And next thing you know, you got that guy converted. It works. I have a friend who's a police officer, and he always does that to them, even though he got in trouble one time. But after that, he still does it, and they always end up changing their ways. Anyways, so she always gives us something tangible because we need it. When I was in college, I was not religious at all. I was wearing a miraculous medal sometimes when I wanted stuff or when I was in trouble. But I'd always wear this because Mary promised to St. Simon Stock that anybody who wore their brown scapular as a sign, this is the key, it's not magic. If you're wearing this as a sign, a sign, yeah, as a sign, kind of like I wear my wedding ring as a sign that I'm married. If you wear your brown scapular as a sign that... You're consecrating yourself to the Blessed Mother. Consecration means you're setting yourself aside for holiness. So if you're wearing a brown scapular as a sign saying, Lord, I want to give myself to you. I'm doing the best I can. You're just promising I'm going to do the best I can. Mary, I want your protection. I want you to help guard and protect me just like you guarded and protected the baby Jesus. Jesus was the first one to give himself completely to the Blessed Mother to be taken care of. So all you're doing is you're uniting yourself to Jesus, and you say you're one in the body of Christ, and saying, okay, Mama Mary, help take care of baby me too. That's all you're asking. And so if you wear this as a sign, you wear it underneath your clothes, she promises you that anybody who wears this and, is, and dies, and as long as they're trying, they, they will not suffer the fires of hell. 
I, have, I had a priest friend, and I was going to the University of St. Thomas, and, and this was after I started to have more of a conversion, and it was through these sacramentals, through these holy reminders. What happened, I, I had class at 9 o'clock in the morning, and he, actually he used to be a priest at St. Lawrence. His name was Father Kelly, and he didn't show up at 9 o'clock in the morning. And so I called him on the phone because he, he was helping me to grow in spiritual holiness. I was going to confession a lot with him over there. And so I called him because he was kind of sick, and I was like, is everything okay? And he's like, you'll not believe what happened. And I was like, what? And this was like in January. And I, he said, I said, what? He's like, well, I was driving on the way to school. It was like 8 o'clock in the morning, and there was a terrible car accident. And I pulled over, and I gave the guy the last, you know, because when you're like unconscious, if you're still alive, if your body's still warm, the priest can still say, if you hear me, I'm going to give you up. I'm going to... You tell, you think of all your sins and I'll absolve you. Like if you can hear my voice, if you're, if you're somehow still in there, and then I'll, I'll give you conditional absolution. So he said that he pulled over this car. It was, it was, it was all terribly uh, wrecked up. And he felt that the guy was still warm. And, he's like, and he saw that he had a scapular on. And he said, okay, if you, you did the conditional absolution. And the police arrived shortly after. And he said, officer, how long has this car wreck been here like this? And he said, oh, well, look from this and this and this. It looks like it's been here at least since 3 o'clock in the morning. Feel the, feel the metal on the bumper. It's already, you know, like 27 degrees or something like that. And he's like, this guy's been, he's like, this guy's been dead for five hours or something. And then so Father Kelly was, there's no way, man. This guy was alive. He's like, there's no way the guy was alive. This guy was alive. I felt, his, I felt it. I felt it. And he's like, well, no, I'm sorry. That's not true. He's not, he's not alive. So somehow... God kept him alive long enough to get his absolution because he was wearing his brown scapular. Father Kelly knew that he was a uh, Catholic. And then there was a story I read in a book where a guy was at a, at a train crossing and his, tr- his car got hit by a train and his body was cut in half and he lived long enough to, to have a priest come and go to confession. What? And then, but you can't be a tricky because I also read a story where there was these people who were getting, they were living in Mexico and they were put up to be shot at the uh, firing squad. And the guy was like, ha, 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 I've got my scapular, I killed all you people. And then when they, they shot him and the guy was, you could tell he was like reaching around and he was looking, you know, see if he had a scapular and the scapular was like 10 feet away from him. So it was like, you never did, you can't be tricking the Blessed Mother. She knows, you know, you can get that scapular off of you somehow. Is what we'll, we'll do as our closing prayer is we'll kneel down and... We'll say, we can look at the Sacred Heart of Jesus and we'll say this prayer together. And then we'll also say the prayer to the Blessed Mother. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Sacred Heart of Jesus, to Thee I consecrate and offer up my person and my life, my actions, trials, and sufferings, that my entire being may henceforth only be employed in loving, honoring, and glorifying Thee. This is my irrevocable will to belong entirely to Thee, and to do all for Thy love, renouncing with my whole heart all that can displease Thee. I take Thee, O Sacred Heart, for the sole object of my love, the protection of my life, the pledge of my salvation, the remedy of my frailty and inconstancy, the reparation for all the defects of my life, and my secure refuge at the hour of my death. Be Thou, O most merciful heart, my justification before God Thy Father, and screen me from his anger which I have so justly merited. I fear all from my own weakness and malice, but placing my entire confidence in thee, O heart of love, I hope all from your infinite goodness. Annihilate in me all that can displease or resist thee. Imprint thy pure love so deeply in my heart that I may never forget thee or be separated from thee. I beseech thee through thine infinite goodness, grant that my name be engraved upon thy heart, For in this I place all my happiness and all my glory, to live and to die as one of your devoted servants. Amen. Most Holy Virgin Mary, tender mother of men, to fulfill the desires of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the request of the Vicar of your Son on earth, we consecrate ourselves and our families to your sorrowful and immaculate heart, O Queen of the Most Holy Rosary, and we recommend to you all the people of our country and all the world. Please accept our consecration, dearest Mother, and use us as you wish to accomplish your designs in the world. O sorrowful and immaculate heart of Mary, Queen of the Most Holy Rosary and Queen of the world, rule over us together with the sacred heart of Jesus Christ, our King. Save us from the spreading flood of modern paganism. Kindle in our hearts and homes the love of purity, the practice of a virtuous life, an ardent zeal for souls, and a desire to pray the rosary more faithfully. We come with confidence to you, O throne of grace and mother of fair love. Inflame us with the same divine fire which has inflamed your own sorrowful and immaculate heart. 
make our hearts and homes your shrine. And through us, make the heart of Jesus, together with your rule, triumph in every heart and home. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit.